From pod617.com, the Boston Podcast Network, it's Higher Ground. Now here's your host, higher education attorney, John Graff. Love it. Love the song. Welcome back, Aaron and Dave. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you guys uh, face-to-face, so uh, good to see you. Hopefully, we'll get back in the studio uh, in person soon. I miss that, definitely. Um, someday. Welcome back. Someday. What's that? Someday. Some, someday it'll happen. <laughs> someday, right. You want to make a prediction on when that day is going to be? No, I've given up on predictions. Every, every one of my predictions has been wrong. Aaron? I give up. The world makes no sense. Tom Brady's on the Buccaneers. I would like to not talk about that, please, ever again. Yeah, that's a sensitive subject for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, we're not um, going to go into that, no. No, no. Uh, so welcome back also, everybody who's out there, uh, kind enough to tune in and listen to us for a bit today. Uh, we know your time is valuable and that you choose to spend it with us means absolutely everything to us. Last time we talked was back on March 20, and we were talking about the coronavirus impact on higher education and boy have things changed in just the course of not even you know 30 full days at, at this point uh you'll recall that we had uh my good friend and law partner pete moser on who had a lot of practical advice for uh employers including higher ed on how to manage the COVID situation um i wanted to take a little bit of a break today from covid get in uh because we're just all inundated with it at this point uh, nevertheless, it's still impacting some of what we do in higher ed and, and how we do it. Uh, and some of that relates to Title IX. So um, rumor has it that the Title IX regs are imminent. As we all know, there are some radical changes. I use that term intentionally. There are some radical changes in the Title IX regs. Um, we've been hearing that they are imminent for many, many, many months. And so are we really getting close? Thus, the episode today, the new Title IX regs, are they imminent and what does that mean? So we're joined today by two very prominent Title IX minds and all around good people to help us figure out what's happening with these regs uh, in higher ed in light of the pandemic um, and in light of the regulatory changes. Um, Dave, help me welcome Courtney Bullard. California. There you go. <laughs> so Courtney Bullard is a lawyer and owner of Institutional Compliance Solutions with, um, based on the website now, uh, over 10 years of experience representing institutions, including eight years as a university system attorney. Um, I've got about eight months as a system attorney, Courtney. So Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I was in-house for a, a stopover. Um, as in-house counsel. Courtney served as a trusted advisor to the chancellor, vice chancellors, athletic director, director um, of office, and that's what it says. What Just a lot of people. And a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of um, higher ups. <laughs> and importantly, the Title IX coordinator. Courtney is also the host of a podcast that I like to listen to, which is the Long Higher Ed podcast, and is a nationally recognized attorney for her contributions to news media, including the Chronicle of Higher Education. I've read your name there. Inside Higher Ed, I've read it there. Uh, Vice News on HBO, which I have not seen yet. Um, Courtney is also the creator of Title IX University, which is an online digital platform that provides Title IX training and also has some triage expertise, uh, remote triage expertise, which we're gonna talk about later. Now, uh, before I turn to our next guest, I just want to note something that's very unique about how Courtney and I met. Courtney, do you remember where we met? I don't, I feel like you told me and now I don't remember. You're putting me on the spot. If I say the name Mohegan Sun, does that ring a bell? Oh, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We both spoke at the summit. At a Title IX conference that was actually held at Mohegan Sun of all places. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, Mohegan Sun is what? A casino. Um, I literally had no idea where that was going. <laughs> kind of an interesting <laughs> place for a Title IX conference, don't you think? Um, a, a, an environment where vice prevails. So, um, Dave, help me welcome Scott Schneider now. Oh, oh man, I saw that Saturday Night Live back when it aired. Nice. So Scott Schneider, where does one even begin? Um, so Scott's a partner at Hush Black. Not at the Mohegan Sun, that's for sure. 
<laughs> oh, I'm sure it's more sorted than that. Um, so Scott is, according to his website, and I agree with all of these statements, a prominent litigator and a sought after advisor on Title, title IX labor and employment law issues and risk management concerns within student affairs. He is a very seasoned investigator, um, a very knowledgeable clearing mind, uh, so most people don't know this about uh, Scott and me. So for years, I did the NACUA lawyers to uh, new lawyers, you know, new to NACUA thing. Um, and I did their Cleary intro training. And then one year, I didn't get invited back. And I was like, oh, what is this all about? And so, of course, you know, I read that Scott Schneider has taken over for me. And I thought at the time, one of two things has happened. Either NACUA is loosening its standards or I need to up my game either way. <laughs> Either way, I attended his session and I thought it was great. Um, they didn't do any background check that year, and thank goodness for that. Yeah, they would have had you out at the beard, man. Yeah, I think the uh, beard was a, a little uh, less unruly then. <laughs> well, either way, uh, we're grateful to you both for joining us. Uh, you bring a lot of wisdom to the discussion. So uh, let me just tee it up. We've got Title IX regs that we have been promised will be published now since back in 2019. So who knows whether they're actually coming out right away. Uh, I've got some informal intel that indicates that they may be out towards the end of April sometime in May and that they're being held up right now because of some internal um, logistics issues within Department of Ed. Um, I've also heard a rumor that the compliance deadline would be sometime towards the end of the summer. So obviously we are shut down in higher ed right now in terms of on-campus learning, right? Um, so I imagine that the shutdown might impact how swiftly we're actually expected to comply with these things. But there's another wrinkle. I'm also hearing the word on the street that several state attorneys general are planning to file a lawsuit against the Department of Education to enjoin um, enforcement of the regulations. So, you know, we've got a, a contingent of people who are lawyers on this call and then some non or on this conference and then some non lawyers. Um, Scott, as a quote prominent litigator, help us understand, <laughs> help us understand what is an injunction? What does that mean when I tell the world that, hey, somebody's going to file an injunction motion against the Department of Ed? Yeah, I mean, in, in this context, uh, I think the most basic way to explain it is to say, uh, court, we want you to step in here and say, you don't have to comply with these regs at this point. I mean, that's the, I, I think the, the best, easiest way to explain it. And I was thinking about, we, we were talking about this earlier, I mean, the sort of the last time that I remember sort of a high profile reg um, state attorney generals deciding to fight it was the FLSA changes back in, at the end of the Obama administration. They were going to change, I think, um, the overtime rules to basically make it um, more difficult for employers to claim exemptions and for uh, employees, more employees to be covered by the overtime rules. And there was, I think, about 20, 25 state attorney generals who got together and filed the lawsuit. And it was here. I'm in Austin. Uh, it was here in the Eastern District of Texas where a court basically came back and said, um, no, we're, we're enjoining enforcement of, of these new regs or this new rule. And again, the, the net impact of that was it was as if the rules were published and nobody had to follow them. So that's... If we go down that route, I mean, that's that's what I would expect to see here. Um, I don't know which state, I, I can't imagine, for instance, on this one, um, like Texas would be involved in that. So it'd be interesting to see which states get together. I think, you know, Cuomo has been pretty outspoken on this, but it would basically be a collection of states getting together, going to a court and saying, block enforcement of these regulations. Um, and so, Courtney, your sense as to whether higher ed, just generally, would like to see these regulations in their current in their current form blocked? Um, I think, in general, yes. Especially with everything that's going on with COVID, they've got enough on their plates. So, I think the general consensus, at least for my clients, would be not to have to add something else. On the flip side, I also think there's a lot of folks, especially like myself, that's like, let's just get on with it. 
if we're gonna have to comply and this is gonna happen, then let's just do it so that we can move on with our lives instead of all these conspiracy theories every other week on when they're gonna drop and if they're gonna drop and whether they're gonna drop in the same form and how much money is it gonna to cost to come into compliance and all the other things that are gonna happen. So um, I think that as we've already talked about, higher ed has a lot on its plate. Um, to some degree, and I know we'll get into this in a minute, but some Title IX offices um, are winding down. You know, they don't have as many reports coming in. So yeah, I mean, the summer could be a time to get into compliance if these regs are gonna come. Um, but by the same token, personally, people are dealing with a lot as well. It's not all about um, their jobs when they're trying to work from home. So I don't know. My feeling is like, let's just get on with it. Let's just do this. Yeah, that's where I am too. I mean, I, I feel like we've been talking about this and for how long, John? It's like two years now? Yeah, two years. It's like beating a dead horse. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. it's two years. And I think, you know, if my memory serves me, last summer, Scott, we did a pod episode uh, where we talked about, you know, the new regs and what was going to happen. You know, so. And so much in the new regs, at least in the jurisdiction I'm in, I mean, the circuit I'm in is the Sixth Circuit. So a lot of my clients are Sixth Circuit clients. A lot of what's in the regs, not all of it, but some things are certainly consistent with why we're seeing litigation trends anyways. So um, people in California, people in Sixth Circuit, they're already having to make some of those changes, uh, or at least we're advising them to make some of those changes. And is that because of the Baum decision? Yep, Baum yeah. and um, I mean, pretty much that was the catalyst, I would say. I can't, so, I can't think off the top of my head the one in California right now, but um, yeah, the bomb, we're already having bomb hearings and things like that at most of the state schools, um, which are very similar to what o OCR is going to require in the new regs. And help me understand, Courtney, how, when you say we're, we're already having bomb hearings, what does that mean? So uh, moving to a lot of the institutions already have live hearings, but moving to live hearings where you allow cross-examination by an advisor um, in some way, shape, or form. So wow. either submitting questions that the chair is able to ask on behalf of a party, that's what you mostly see, um, and then the chair is in the position of having to decide what's relevant and what's not and all those great things. Um, but uh, kind of following that same framework, you had some institutions that were state institutions that were single investigator and have moved away from that into a hearing model. Uh, at the very least, it's kind of on the bomb, when you talk about a bomb hearing, at the very least going from losing the single investigator model going to a hearing. Um, but then you have many who've also moved into um, ensuring everybody has an advisor and then the ability to submit questions to a chair and, and ask questions of each other. I haven't seen any where they're, well, that's not true. <laughs> Never mind. I take that back. <laughs> yeah, so I I'll ask this question of either one of you. Um, have you had an opportunity to actually sit in on one of these hearings? Yes. Th thoughts? How'd it go? I won't name the school, but um, it, it was less than ideal. <laughs> 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 it's just, I, you know, it's to, to ramp up. I mean, look, um, courts have been doing live hearings for hundreds of years and there's a lot of institutional knowledge and expertise and we know how to do it um, for especially privates where there's really no uh, I you know outside of California I mean I don't know of a private institution that has had quote full-blown due process hearings for much of anything outside of tenure revocation um, this is this is very new, and when people try new things that end up being a little complicated, what you're going to find are there's going to be a whole host of mistakes that you make early on. It's just like anything else that you do in life: riding a bike, you know, <laughs> making a steak, whatever. I mean, it's uh, there, there are going to be some errors in, in ramping it up, and some of that we can we can train around and, and train people up. I'm not one of these people thinks this has to be an absolute disaster we can train people up we can put the right people in these positions uh, but these are these are hard to do these things well it's very very difficult and by the way we're, we're doing them um, in a setting that's probably as difficult emotionally as any setting humanly imaginable I mean even if I've, I've tried cases uh, civil cases, you know, discrimination cases, what have you, those are hard enough. Trying cases where the issue is whether or not 
someone was sexually assaulted is just rife with all sorts of emotional energy uh, that, you know, just makes it, it piles on to what is already a very difficult process. It's very Actually, messy. It's messy for institutions that yeah. aren't familiar with live hearings to, to move into. And for some of the smaller schools, they don't have a ton of hearings. They may have one a year. So you're having to kind of relearn every time, even when you train the people up. Um, whereas some of the other schools, especially the publics, are used to a hearing process and they're just kind of tweaking. And, and we always say, like, when you try something new, you I mean you learn from your mistakes. And it's just, given the stakes for both students here, man, it's just hard to acknowledge that we're going to go from one sort of way of doing things to a radically different way of doing things. And by doing that, I mean, we have to acknowledge that probably a whole host of mistakes are going to be made in that transition. And that's just kind of painful. That's been my biggest gripe with, with all of this is um, we finally, it took us a while to finally start doing this work really well after the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. And of course, I think mistakes were made at the front end, which a lot of people seize on now. Um, and now what we're going to do is radically change the way we, we do these things for a number of different schools. And then, you know, we'll probably at some point become proficient at that. And then another administration presumably will come in. I don't think Donald Trump's going to serve forever. Is that a possibility? <laughs> Okay. I don't know. <laughs> but but at some point we'll have another administration and the pendulum will swing and yes. it's just it's I, exhausting it, it, every time you make a change like that you, you don't ramp up you don't start at perfect or you don't start at mistake free you're going to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes i just don't think these radical changes serve um students well agreed yeah it was it was tough right it's tough back in 2011 to get your head wrapped around the guidance. Um, and so what we saw in my firm were two things. At the time, we were um, doing the investigations ourselves, you know, and those would usually be like a high profile investigation. You have some senior executive or board member or somebody who's under investigation. Um, you know, I guess when it comes to sexual harassment, um, a little bit more hands-on we were when it came to domestic violence. That seemed to be a harder one for institutions to investigate back then. Um, and then we started doing the co-investigator models where it's not just us necessarily, we would be with an administrative person like a Title IX coordinator or something. They would ride shotgun and those, you know, they serve to add an element of, I guess, enhanced fairness to the process, but also as a live training for the in-house person. And you know, to Scott's point, you, you could see the level of sophistication in, in the in-house investigators just going up and up and up and up. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say you saw a lot better of an outcome for a lot of people. Um, hold on, my video is walking. And so <laughs> I'm back, yeah. And so, <laughs> Now, to your point, Scott, that's something I've got some concern about, too, is just, you know, do we spend another four years as, you know, training higher ed to handle this, you know, probably having them spend a lot of money on outsourcing to, you know, hearing officers, and, you know, people who can actually steer the relevance discussion, you know, balance the equities in the room, only to have another sea change later. And then what does that do to the actual parties to these cases? You know, in five years, if the regs drop, say the regs drop now, five years from now, there's a new administration. And now, am I on one side of that V just claiming that whatever happened to me in my process three years ago or four years ago was just not fair? And I, I don't know how you restore the, the fairness field. Um, I, I think maybe, you know, and I've said this publicly, I think part of what is, I mean, if we're being honest, I mean, part of what's, and I haven't seen what the final regs, I've only seen the proposed regs. Um, I don't know what's going to be in the final, but I think if we're being honest, what <laughs> part of the policy aim here is to make it as difficult as possible for someone to want to participate in this process. And so what I, what I think part of the policy aim is to say, 
we don't like this process all that much. We don't think schools should be in this business of adjudicating these sorts of claims. If they are, we're going to make it as cumbersome and difficult as possible. And there, there are two things that can happen if, if I'm right about that in an environment like that. The, the first thing is that basically people who are victims of sex misconduct say, I'm not even going to report any of this. It goes, the reports go you know, back to where they have been historically, which is people don't come forward because they don't want to go through a process that looks more and more like a gauntlet. I mean, the idea of direct cross-examination in a school by a lawyer um, is just, it's sort of mind boggling uh, when you think about the history of higher ed. The other, and this is, I'm more optimistic about this. The, the other possibility here is, we start looking for non-adjudicatory ways to resolve some of these complaints. And in particular, with vehicles like restorative justice or some rigorous informal ways uh, that, you know, don't put people and our students through what, what looks like, you know, basically a, a, a civil hearing, a criminal hearing or whatever. Uh, I'm a little more optimistic about that um, and the possibilities there, but I, I think that will be, the net impact, assuming that the final regs are what we suspect the final regs would be, I would think the net impact of that is going to be students no longer wanting to come forward and participating in the process and maybe not even coming forward at all, which would be a tragedy, or students looking and clamoring when appropriate for some sort of alternative way to resolve what is a, you know, a terribly difficult um, problem. Yeah, I agree with Scott. I think we're going to see a huge upsurge in informal resolution type processes with the caveat that that can also be dangerous in some respects because this whole restorative justice term is being thrown around. And um, even in my own conference with our keynote speaker, her definition of restorative justice was not what my understanding was. And a lot of outfits out there now doing quote unquote restorative justice training. Um, and that can be dangerous in its own way and and so my big soapbox these days is I love the idea of informal resolutions I think it can work really really well whatever that's going to or alternative resolutions but getting really clear on what that means like mediation means something totally different to a lawyer than what they're using it you know you just hear all these terms being thrown around and making sure schools are intentional with whatever it is that they decide to do and not trying to um, go become school you know, licensed therapists with an honorary degree um, to try to move these through the process, if that makes sense. So I agree that that could, I think it could be great actually, but it's, there's going to be some errors there too as well. And I don't know what those errors are going to look like for the parties sometimes. Um, that could also be dangerous. It's, I think it's tricky. It's sort of like <clears throat> to analogize it to something I'm seeing happen right now is, you know, the world has gone to online learning. Right. Um, and the it, it's it's really impacting students. I, you know, I've got school age kids. Um, I know you do, Courtney, as well. Scott, I think you do as well. Right. Um, it's impacting their day to day existence in a big way. And one thing I'm seeing sometimes is sort of some unrealistic expectations of parents as to what the teachers can reasonably accomplish, you know, during those sessions. Right. It's not a matter of excellence at this point it's a matter of survival and so you know but when you're not deeply in the know you don't really have a way sometimes to discern you know what's a great experience versus a not great experience and i would think that that applies to people going through the title IX process at any school especially if there's a hearing model in place you know you're not going to know whether you could have had a better outcome with a different hearing officer or you know you're not even going to know what the training looked like behind the scenes and I think having worked as a, a sexual assault investigator as a police officer for a while, parties need to know whether they are on the respondent side or the complainant side exactly what the process is all about and they need to have some faith in the qualifications of the people who do that job. So, um, Amen. 
Speaking of just, I'm going to totally switch gears on you. I heard Dave uh, earlier talking about qualifications, talk about um, Tom Brady. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just, I just, I do feel sad for the uh, the people of Boston. It must be really difficult to have lost the second best quarterback of all time uh, to the Tampa. Here we go. Here we go. And I, okay. I just, I just want you to know, I have a lot of empathy, Dave, for you and John and Aaron. I don't know what your affiliation is with the professional football team. For instance, my team, the New Orleans Saints, if we had lost the greatest quarterback of all time to an inferior team in the league, I would be devastated. So um, I Grace, just want you to you know. Can you shut his a... mic? Can you shut him down? <laughs> I can. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Nah, man. I mean, it, yeah. If we're going to talk about you know, quarterback qualities, at least comparing Tom Brady to Drew Brees. Uh, you know, thank you. I think that's fair. Ish. Yeah. Well, um, Drew Brees is the best quarterback of all time. Thank you. All right. So Scott's a guest and we treat our guests fairly. So you can have the last word on that. Um, I'll get it. Their scandal was more deplorable than our scandal. At least we didn't pay people to knock people's heads off. Touche. You know, uh, but technically, uh, Drew was not embroiled in that scandal, unlike uh, cheater Tom Brady, who was. Okay. All right. <laughs> Aaron, can you cross him off the guest list from now on, please? Um, Thank you, Scott. Thanks for uh, joining. I, I, in all seriousness, uh, Scott's a good friend, and this is how we, this is how we do all the time. Um, it is a constant ritual of trading barbs and shots, et cetera. So, um, Courtney. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about um, triaging of Title IX cases in the current remote pandemic model. Um, well, there's a lot at play at the moment. Um, I think folks are, as I already mentioned, dealing with both professional and personal issues as they transition to working at home. I worked from home and a half for years, but I have four children who are now also working from home. So that proves to be interesting as they run across at all every time I'm on a call or in a zoom luckily they're behaving right now but um so a lot of these town nine professionals are at home they also have kids at home or family members are taken care of um, I think from a triage perspective that's the first and foremost thing they've got to worry about is personally taking care of themselves and, and figuring out what's going on in certain states people are falling ill and all those good things and then um professionally you know, a lot of folks are in the middle of doing investigations and moving from in-person investigations to virtual investigations. I think at this point, we're what, a month in or something. Um, I'm sure your clients are, are kind of figuring that out and things are going okay. Uh, there's, there's been challenges to that by attorneys, of course. Um, but for the most part, that transition is happening okay. Um, then there's the, you know, will we, will they still be getting new uh, complaints and what that's going to look like going forward, whether there's any policy changes that need to be made um, in order to address this new virtual world or not. Um, and I think that, you know, when we've surveyed some folks in some of our webinars, we've had like hundreds of people in there and we'll do these polls asking how everybody's doing. And pretty much on average, everyone's responds fair. <laughs> some people are doing well, some people are not, are really struggling. And, but most folks I think are figuring out a new rhythm. Overall, I think complaints are obviously going to go down as students aren't um, having that interaction. Uh, I do have my own predictions for when, when and if campuses open back up for those students that can return. I think there's going to be like mega COVID parties at the fraternities and a huge, you know, <laughs> explosion of things at some point. It might be a year from now, but at some point I think that's going to happen. But, uh, and then thinking about new behaviors that might be alleged as a result of this new environment. So like what? Well, I've had cases of folks who are HIV positive who then go have uh, sexual relationships well, with people and, and then don't tell them. Uh, I could see that happening. And then more importantly, I think what we'll see more of is um, just in the online context, harassment and stalking maybe coming out um, more you know, in the online context going forward. I don't know what these new behaviors are going to be. And I think, but that's something I think we all have to be thinking about and that Title IX coordinators are having to think about. And then one thing we've talked to them a lot about is sustainability planning and, you know, having backups for their backups. I mean, we've done it as a team here. If I get sick, where does that case go? Managing expectations, staying engaged and ensuring that, um, you know, there are a lot of schools that have very large Title IX offices and coming up with 
um, those plans are not so difficult, but then there are plenty of schools where it's one or two people. And so what if your Title IX coordinator falls ill and has a leave of absence for a period of time? Something that probably should have been thought about before, but obviously is way more imminent now with the COVID-19 situation. And if you're in the middle of an investigation and you fall ill, you know, you don't want those parties to hear crickets on the other end. You've got to, they've got to start setting up at the beginning to manage those expectations and kind of overly communicating and just thinking through those hard, those hard things. Is that something your company, Institutional Compliance Solutions, is that something that you guys are doing now? Are you providing that redundancy? Yeah, I mean, we're mostly at this point um, working with our clients uh, where we serve as legal counsel to help them in that transition. But then we've had some institutions where we've come in, looked at their open cases. That's our triage service. We take their open cases, we help them figure out how to transition. The thing that um, might be getting a little lost in the shuffle is support measures and just helping them not just look at open cases, but look at past cases where support measures are in place and reaching out to those students to figure out you know, are these support measures ongoing? Are they no contact directives that apply even when you're not on campus? Some schools they do, some schools they don't. So really evaluating and making sure that there's that continuity um, and that support is still being offered if needed. So from a triage perspective, it's threefold really, looking at their policies, getting them moved over to the virtual with their active cases, and then also looking at um, their entire case log and past cases and what support measures are still ongoing. So I, um, w right, we have to talk later um, because we do have some work I think we need to do on that front together. <laughs> um, Scott, let me flip this to the Cleary features of, of some of this compliance for a second. Um, and I didn't mean to cut you off, I, did, I see what you were about to say something, but um, in terms of, you know, Courtney's talking about offering support measures, we've got to disclose that we can offer those support measures in our uh, Clery compliance documents, our annual security report, et cetera. What does this mean for those disclosures at this point? Can we actually meet the promises in the current era that we're making in our annual security report just last year? It, I think it depends on what we put in our annual security report, yes, and uh, what promises we've, we've made and if we need to make adjustments. I don't think anybody anticipated anything like this happening. If we need to make adjustments, make the adjustments. I was more interested, I'll be honest with you, John, less interested in Cleary. I, I was intrigued by something Courtney said, which was mega COVID parties. And I immediately thought, John, <laughs> we should start a band. We should start a band. Oh, man. Oh, man. Me it's called Mega COVID. You're welcome. You're welcome, guys. I'll expect we, royalties on the name. We will, we will, go, <laughs> oh, we, no. we will go to, we will go to campuses yeah. throughout America, and we will rage, John. You'll generate will. business for me while y'all are out there raging, <laughs> unfortunately. My, my question is... <laughs> <laughs> Another little mega death clip there. Um, I'm more of a kingmaker guy myself, but um, you know that I, I will say this one: a couple of really. Uh, I, so I'm going to piggyback off of what Courtney was saying. I mean, the the good news is, at least in in my experience, yeah, we're we're getting some interesting new cases. I've I've seen a lot more cyber stalking type mm -hmm. things now uh, than, than we did before, but caseload is coming down. And I, you know, the guidance I'm trying to give clients is you know, take the time, first off, do your investigations, make sure they're really, really good. One of the interesting things is it's been easier to schedule interviews now because people are home, they're not bouncing around to classes and parties and extracurriculars. We can get you know them, and so let's do what we can to quickly uh, and uh, with a high degree of quality process our investigations. But use this time. That's why I'm almost hoping the regs drop sooner rather than later. Give people as much time as un humanly possible to start transitioning to whatever the final regs are going to say. And we have some time. I mean, to focus on what does good policy look like in, in this space? What does a, you know, a top-notch training program look in, like in this space? The sort of things that you typically don't have time to do because you're just so overwhelmed with um, the, the caseloads that you're, you're facing. Uh, use this time productively. Yeah, that's a lot of things. I mean, we've taken with our clients to sat down with their teams when that aren't having active cases right now to say, 
how can you be proactive going forward? I mean, this is unprecedented time for them where we're always, you know, I'm sure all of us are, are doing webinars or trainings and telling them all the things they need to be doing to be proactive and to have robust policies and procedures, but there's not the time to do it because all the top nine coordinators are drinking from a fire hose on a daily basis, just trying to get through the day. Now there's that opportunity um, that they haven't had before to kind of get some training if they've got the funding, um, but also to sit down as a team and work together on on future stuff. So even without the NPRM, it's a great time for that. But if the NPRM is going to come out, then now would be helpful. Uh, yeah, and at I, least they've got the time to do it. And sure. and I know outside. I mean, I know we're talking a lot about Title IX and Clery, but you know, outside of that, the the conversation I've been having this week more than any other conversation is. Um, schools saying we need to figure out a way to be open in the mm -hmm. fall and what does yeah. that look like and how do we manage risk and it's I find it to be the most fascinating complicated um, question that that schools are, are wrestling with and and we're also working I, I keep hearing this word fluid I'm so sick of it there needs to be a new one but yeah we're, we're in an environment where the facts are changing on a daily basis if tomorrow and I saw something on Twitter yesterday about wow we're making developments in terms of an antiviral response to this virus that you you know you get it if you're symptomatic um, you can take this medicine that's from some company, I don't even remember the name, and you, the, the chances of you dying go down considerably. I mean, if we're making progress in that regard, well, the risk management calculations become super, super different in terms of bringing students back in the fall semester. I have a, I have a daughter, she goes to LSU, uh, by the way, Go Tigers, uh, greatest football, greatest college football team of all time. I think even Dave Yaz would agree. Do you see this, Scott? This would be Alabama. Yeah, roll time. Roll time. <laughs> that's, we, our house. that's our house. Oh, we, we did, got Auburn. We, oh, man. We, we did beat Alabama and Auburn last no, year. No, I know. I know, I know. But, but, I, God bless her. She's a junior in college. She wants to go back next fall. And yeah. part of that is the alternative is staying here with me. And I could understand why someone would want to exit that situation as promptly as possible. But she wants to get on with some sense of, you know, normalcy with her life and, and all that, so long as it's safe. <laughs> that was brutal, Dave Yaz. Um, I was... <laughs> I was at that game and needed a therapist immediately after that. I thought it was a pretty good non-call. <laughs> so for those of you who are watching us on our YouTube channel, you can see that Dave Yaz is taunting Scott Schneider. Um, <laughs> if you're just listening, then you're missing the fun. So it's a it's, Saints heartbreak moment. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, there's been a lot of those, but I, and, and so what, what does from a, and talk about Cleary, I mean, what does that look like from a safety perspective? Um, you well, know, and my it, clients feel very part bipolar. They're like, we're preparing to not go back and we're preparing to go back. We're preparing for furloughs and not going back and we're preparing to go back and what safety measures have to be put in place. Like it's, nobody knows. It's crazy. But yeah, from a safety perspective and clearly it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. So it's funny. Um, Joe Storch and I did a, uh, an actual web briefing last Tuesday. I listened. Uh, it was very good. Oh, thank you. Uh, the turnout was great. There were like 640 people on there. Um, you know, because I think people are interested. They wanted to know two things, really. One, what was the, um, you know, what do we do about emergency notifications in light of the corona pandemic, right? Um, and specifically, I think the question was across the, the industry, what happens when we get a positive case? Do we have to send out an emergency notification? And my thought on that was always like, it's sort of like, diving into a shallow swimming pool at this point. Going outside of your house is an open and obvious risk. And by the time the Department of Ed actually decided to issue its guidance on when, anybody? April 3, after all of higher ed had been shut down for like two and a half or three weeks, you know, it starts to water down the importance of sending out some kind of emergency notice you know the other issue is what does that mean for your crime on campus you're not going to have any crime on campus your statistics are going to go way down to your point courtney your online harassment type statistics you know they may, the information is there the incidents may increase but it doesn't necessarily translate to clearly because most people can't be on campus anyway right um you know what we're starting to see in our practice is a lot of thinking about 
emergency management planning around the return, you know, as Scott was saying, to campus. Um, what do we do if we bring everybody back and there's a second wave and we've got to now shut down again after, you know, 30 days or 15 days? Um, or, you know, when this semester's in full swing right before finals. Uh, and that just brings a host of, of risk mitigation concerns to bear, um, you know, uh, safety considerations, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that I'm hearing is that, you know, there'll be a sort of a, a phased in return, you know, we'll let either certain years or certain programs come back. And I think to the point that Courtney was making earlier, you know, that, that lull of that period of time where we can actually get our affairs in order, you know, that window will shrink as more and more people are on campus and then there's more and more in-person mm -hmm. contact, et cetera. So use the time wisely, right? Yeah, um, I just, I wanted to point out that NACUA only asked you to do that because I refused. <laughs> yeah, good. good. There are A-list celebrities who have made fortunes because they were the second person in. So thank Hilarious. you. Thank you for being too high on the horse there, buddy. Um, so <laughs> the cringe laugh. Um, in terms of... Uh, Besides just the hearing, I love the shade, Scott. Besides the hearing dynamics, you know, the in-person cross-exam, the cross-exam by a lawyer, what are a couple of other concerns we're hearing from our clients about the impact of these new regs? Just, I, I mean, that it's it's clearly going to increase cost um, because you know you're you're literally putting someone who who may be a student affairs professional in the position of having to make evidentiary decisions that even for seasoned judges are exceptionally complicated. And so I think most schools are realizing eh, we're probably going to have to outsource this. And um, I think that was bad enough prior to Corona, but the, the, the hit on institutional budgets associated with this, and and no one comes out of this, by the way unscathed. There's not, a, there's not a college or university in the country that is not going to take a significant hit. You know, I, I, this is an unfunded mandate in a time where we have serious concerns about our operational budget. So I, that's the, the biggest one is how in the heck are we going to put someone in that position? How are we going to pay for that, especially given sort of the challenges, not sort of the, the challenges, the incredible challenges that we will be facing because of this unprecedented disaster? Right, people are losing their jobs. They're being furloughed, they're being laid off or terminated, mm -hmm. et cetera. And now the government's coming in and saying, hey, you're gonna, you basically get, you're gonna have to hire up this resource. Yeah, we're going to give, especially for private schools, we're, we're going to give you under the guise of a civil rights statute, um, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. We're going to force you in your student conduct um, department to, in essence, enact the most rigorous form of due process um, imaginable in a, in a time. And so it's like, well, all right, how do we staff that? Um, yeah. And, you know, there's, I don't um, know. Well, and, and the thing is, what actually falls under the definition of sexual harassment under the new regs is going to be not as much conduct is going to fall under that that will require the rigorous process. But regardless, if, if things come out the way there's, that they were proposed, which we don't know. But regardless, there's things um, like that schools have to give each party an advisor that aligns with their own interest. I mean, that's not something right now that's required of schools. I mean, there's there's all this depth you're going to need and folks you're going to need to volunteer maybe because you can't pay them to do things that I don't know who's going to want to be put in that position to start with. Um, there's also some record keeping as far as being able to share evidence during the hearings that's on, that has to be kept online. Well, before COVID that seemed really um, daunting. Now after COVID, post COVID, you know, schools are having to do it anyways that already run a hearing process, have a way to share um, information in a secure manner those kinds of things. So to some degree that will help prepare for that. But there's just going to, like Scott said, I mean, there's going to be money that needs to be spent, in my opinion, on changing policies and procedures and processes, like going and copying and pasting or taking a, a boxed policy, of, you know, isn't going to work, in my opinion. You've really got to think about how it impacts your campus and what works best for your campus and then have people help you with implementation of the policy and actual training to do all the things that are going to be required. All that costs money. Um, trying to do it without spending the money is just going to land schools where they've been, which is in litigation. So 
um, money. That's it. Well, those, those schools are certainly well served if they align with Courtney Bullard at Institutional Compliance Solutions, <laughs> Scott Schneider at Law Dude, <laughs> self proclaimed Dave Roll of Higher Ed at Hush Blackwell, uh, Austin office. The location doesn't matter for any of us anymore, right? Because we work remotely. Um, you know, we're certainly here to help at Hirsch Roberts Weinstein. Um, we got a little bit of experience in this uh, neck of the woods. Um, <laughs> I love that picture. Before we wrap, um, closing thoughts, Scott. Are we going to wrap with an R? Actually, Courtney's going to wrap. <laughs> no, I'm she's, not going to wrap. She's a rap person. <laughs> I was not the rapper. <laughs> Even Larson's involved. Yeah. I, no, I, I mean, so I, yeah, I, I said this to you earlier. I mean, it's this, the setting aside title nine and clarity. I mean, this, um, what a, what a remarkable, uh, position we find higher ed in at this point. And, you know, I, I, I think, um, and I, so I was in house at, at Tulane and we were blessed. We had Katrina, um, which was, you know, basically impacted the entire campus. And, we're blessed to have a president and, and Scott Cowan, who was just this amazing leader. And basically one thing he said was we're reopening in January and everybody thought he was crazy for saying that, but he also took the opportunity to basically make a lot of the changes that the hard changes that the university knew it needed to make for a long, long time. Uh, and finally sort of a crisis allowed it the, the opportunity to make those hard changes and frankly put it on a trajectory for the next decade to 15 years where you know it's a lot healthier place. And so I, I think, again, setting aside nine and Cleary and all that sort of stuff, that that's the that's where we are. I mean, we we have a moment right now in this time of crisis to do really good deep thinking about where do we want to be in a decade uh, from now, and then making hopefully the courageous decisions to to get to that place. Excellent, excellent, um, guys. I can't thank you enough for joining us. I could listen to you guys all day. Um, you know, I really I have the utmost respect for you. Um, you know, one of the things I love about this uh, circle of Title IX lawyers, and there are others out there too, is that, you know, we come together to share uh, and uh, internally and then externally information. Um, I love that, you know, we're all at different organizations. You know, we all want to uh, promote our businesses and whatnot, um, but we do it uh, together and, you know, we're able to benefit from each other's guidance and knowledge. So thank you very much. Um, Scott, if uh, people want to get a hold of you, how did they do that? Besides you know just blasting on an electric guitar out the window. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to do something weird. Hey, why don't y'all text me? You want to do that? Right How about on. that? I'm going right to give you this on. number. Are you ready for this? Just text me. I'm going to get random texts. I, I, didn't, I didn't plan for this. It's 504-214-4962. Text Aaron, me. could you please promote that everywhere? Everywhere all over fight. the planet? Is a face tattoo okay too? Yeah, I'm I'm totally I'm totally fine. Yeah, if you put the face tattoo just on this cheek right here, um, yeah, five zero four two one four four nine six two. Please text me. All right, and then we'll get the the, the Scott Schneider help for you, um, Courtney. How do people oh, get a hold of you? I mean, you're welcome to text me as well. Maybe we should have a texting war, but I know Scott would win because of the beard and his overall coolness. So I'm afraid to even enter into that competition. But uh, I will say doing this has been really fun and it's always a fun distraction to <laughs> have it on live like this. Scott is definitely, I can't, it's like, I, every time I turn around, he has a different uh, background, it's cracking me up. But anyways, to find me uh, really, my website, www.icslawyer.com. You can um, email me, chb at icslawyer.com. You can call me 423-710-4027 You can text right. me there if you want to. So we're, we're here. And I, just to dovetail on what you said, John, I really love um, the colleagues that I've made in this area across the country that I respect and I know do really great work. It's really fun to collaborate and um, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, we appreciate you guys. I uh, can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your time and your insight with us today. Um, um, 
respect both of you and I know uh, no matter who gets a call from a client they're in good hands with you, either one of you guys um, if you like what you heard today please share us with your friends colleagues family get the word out because you know our goal here is to offer some practical takeaways to the industry and I think we've done that today um, we would very much appreciate it if you'd subscribe to us on what Aaron Spotify or Apple Podcasts, right, Dave? That's it right. used to be iTunes, wasn't it? Right. It used to be yeah, iTunes. Yeah, used to be Apple iTunes. Podcasts. Yeah, and if you want to get a hold of me, um, hit me at JT Graph. It's at JT Graph on Twitter. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Courtney. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Yeah. Stay well. Bye. All right. Soldiers.